have here today um, Dr. Ernie Manders, um, who is uh, a um, surgeon emeritus from the University of Pittsburgh, professor of surgery. We have um, Shauna Pandia, who is the vice president of immersive learning at Luxonic Technologies. We have um, Christy Fennison, who uh, is an instructional uh, um, media producer at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine IT department. And we have William P. Levin, uh, who is an associate professor for radiation oncology at Penn Medicine, University of Pennsylvania Health System. And today we are going to talk about XR for medical education. Uh, really grateful to you all for being here today. Um, I, um, I ask um, Dr. Ernie Manders if he would, would help lead this panel. And so Ernie, would you like to kick off by asking the, the other panelists what they do in XR for medical education? You bet. Karen, thank you. Good to see you. And I must say, uh, it's good to be here and to be sharing or helping to share all this information because in fact, this is the future. One day we'll all be going to class with an, a VR headset, I have no doubt. Now, uh, we only have about 30 minutes, so we're gonna move right along. Christy, why don't you begin, introduce yourself and tell us what you're doing with XR in medical education. Yeah, hi, so I'm Christy Finnison, and I am an XR instructional media producer at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill School of Medicine IT. Um, I'm in a group called Instructional Media Services, and we work with the knowledge experts here, our faculty and our students and the healthcare professionals in our hospital, which is right here on campus too, um, to create uh, content that supports curriculum needs, training needs, um, and in the past few years, we've been working to not only create traditional content, which we've been doing for decades, but also immersive learning content, immersive content um, in the form of virtual reality primarily, but we're looking into moving into mixed reality as well. Uh -huh. Well, great. Uh, Shauna, uh, here we have the academic side and Christy, are, are you in the enterprise side of things? Could you tell us what you do? Yeah, so thank you very much for having me. My name is Dr. Shauna Pandia. I'm the VP of Immersive Medicine at Luxonic Technologies, and we uh, create immersive uh, medical learning modules for radiology. So we have created the world's first VR diagnostic radi radiology reading room. So we've replic replicated the radiology workflow um, in VR. We have Health Canada approval and pending FDA approval. And we've also created medical uh, learning modules in virtual reality for all manner of healthcare provider to help with assessment, training, and standards maintenance. So this includes everyone from the Canadian Space Agency and astronauts on deep space um, healthcare uh, as to remote and rural communities to search and rescue to physicians. Wow, wonderful. Uh, now, Bill, you're in radiation oncology. And if any discipline depends on a 3D appreciation of human anatomy for treatment, it's got to be radiation oncology. Tell us about how yeah. you're using XR. Absolutely right. I, I would kind of put it in a couple big silos, and I know it's not exactly the focus of today's discussion, but a big part of what I do is education for the patients. And so, you know, basically, for those of you that don't know about radiation oncology, we treat cancer. Um, which it has obviously a profound emotional effect on our patients and requires a, whole, a kind of a whole other world than what they're used to to understand the disease. So I am doing a fair amount of um, education with the patients and we found this disconnect between really trying to explain to the patient about their the disease and their treatment. As you can imagine, it's trying, as I say, trying to drink from a fire hydrant frequently and not really understanding. So we're getting ready, and, and now I want to talk to Shauna about what she does, uh, because what, I, what I'm working on right now, we're pretty close to having an IRB approved protocol, is I'm uh, trying to import DICOM images of the patients of their own disease and to really put the headset on and do a fly through their own body to really show them what the disease is and show them the normal anatomy. 
And I think that will be worlds better in terms of comprehension. So I don't think that that activity is completely divorced from the training of medical trainees. And in fact, I think what I look to do is to bring our residents and med students in that consult room when I begin to do that. And, um, you know, to listen to the language and the communication and the dialogue that goes along with being able to visualize the disease itself. Um, now, if we're just talking about the disease, um, it, it, medical education in this country is an interesting thing. As Shauna and Ernie, as you know, you get your anatomy course in the first year of medical school, but you don't really need it till you actually go into your specialty. And by then it's a memory, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I'm looking to do, and as Ernie said, we're, we're essentially, for those people that don't know, we sharpshoot. It's the same kind of, you could think of it as a localized treatment as surgery. And we really, we really need to know what the anatomy is for efficacy of treating the disease, but also for safety of sparing the normal tissue. So what I'm, I, I'm teaching the residents and we're all teaching, I treat mostly lung cancer. And so what we would like to do is we get the trainees on our particular service or people that are doing head and neck cancer where the anatomy is so difficult. We wanna refresh those medical trainees knowledge of anatomy in a way that they've never had it before. And the immersive experience is gonna be leaps and bounds better than gross anatomy or looking at, at a netter book and, um, and, and really what we're looking to do, as the other physicians can appreciate, we're trying to teach people three-dimensional thinking, which is very difficult to do. And we think we can really shorten the learning curve by putting these folks in an immersive experience. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for me, for my part, uh, I have been an academic plastic surgeon for 40 years, and I've done a lot of teaching in that time. And one of the things that brought me into plastic surgery was realizing when I was in general surgery, I kind of had a, a 3D vision. Uh, I knew where things were buried beneath the operative field. And not everybody has that. And I, in teaching and in operating, I, I realized, gee, that was lucky. And, and as this carried forward to ex extremely 3D operations, like repairing a cleft lip and palate, uh, you know, I could see what was coming next kind of thing. Not everybody has that. And I think one of the reasons so many people struggle with this is they've never had a 3D education in anatomy. And with programs today, like Organon, which we've put into the residence room at the University of Pittsburgh, a, a trainee can put on a headset, sit there and look at things in 3D, rotate it in space, actually take it apart and, and then put it back together. And uh, it's an unparalleled opportunity to learn anatomy. And then as an aside, uh, Karen Alexander and I worked in Coos Bay, Oregon, to try to actually introduce AR into medical practice and into education at the Southwestern Oregon Community College. And if we run out of time, we'll tell you about that. The thing that I would say about it to summarize it is, it was a real education in trying to change human behavior. But does it have potential for the future? Oh, yes. Well, uh, from here, I want to ask a few questions. And Christy, I'm going to start with you, if I may. How do you prepare teaching materials for presentation as virtual reality teaching sessions? How, what is in, involved in, if I came to you and said, hey, I want to show how to repair a cleft lip, what would be involved and what would you and your colleagues do? Yeah, um, so with any project that comes to us, um, we always start with a, a discovery meeting. We understand not only you know what they're asking for right now, but why they're asking for it. What, what need are they trying to meet in helping their students um, learn? And um, the first thing would be determining like, is this even appropriate? you know, for virtual reality as it needed. Once that's determined, um, usually we will go work with them on developing kind of like a script, an outline of how the simulation should go. And if the interactions that are in there, what what interactions do we have in this um, script? And so we, we actually get that all written out beforehand, before any, you know, filming and that kind of stuff, if we're doing a 360 simulation before filming. Um, 
And then there is an iterative process of reviewing um, with the, the stakeholder, the, the professor, the, the healthcare professional from our hospital um, to determine whether um, this is meeting what they were asking for. And for some projects, like um, one of our projects is uh, a patient's point of view going through a trauma resuscitation. And in, or in order to design that to actually meet the need, the need was helping our healthcare professionals understand that perspective of being a patient um, so that they could have a deeper empathy and understanding for it in order to improve their communication skills, patient communication skills. Um, in order to even create our, our um, what we wanted to include, what we needed to address and, and highlight, we held a focus group. Um, and focus groups can be really helpful when you're <laughs> deciding what needs to go into a simulation with with the actual um, not only the people who would be using it but the people um, that the education is about so this focus group had some of our educators as well as representatives from our um, patient and um, family um, advocacy group um, these are people who have been uh, trauma patients in the past or and have been the family members of patients who have gone through a trauma resuscitation in the past. And so they were able to express, you know, in their own words, what could be improved in, um, in the communications that are happening um, in, the, in the emergency room um, so that we could use that um, while designing what, what the learning outcomes should be and how we're going to achieve them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not just having an idea and then just making it it's a lot of research to figure out what what needs you're trying to meet and you know if you can have focus groups to determine um what should be included as well shauna uh i'd like to ask uh, here's you. a actually a little trailer is oh, playing oh, good. yes let's see this Where's Jamie? Jamie's coming, okay. Yeah. Hmm. So this this was just a, a quick clip with some highlights from the simulation. This particular simulation was an interactive 360. Um, so you are in the patient's perspective, but throughout the simulation, you're actually making um, decisions on behalf of the care team. Um, so you're making these decisions and then you're experiencing the impacts of that decision, you know, because it, it affects what happens next during the simulation. Um, so you can see, you know, the impacts of whether you explain what the log roll is or whether you're just suddenly roll. And if, when you're in VR, this is um, it's actually like you it's a very visceral feeling when you're suddenly being rolled to the side. And of course, I had to do a lot of editing to make sure it it got the message across, but didn't make you sick. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, that that was just an example of the one of the simulations that we've been working on here. Oh, um, you. Yeah, I can't hear you, Ernie. Ernie, I think you're on mute. Ernie, we seem yeah. to have lost your audio. Uh, it doesn't look like you're on mute, but I, we we can't hear you just then. Um, uh, how's that? That's I, yes. back. okay. I was trying to cut out any interference, and so thank you. Uh, so, Shauna, uh, I would like to ask you about the how you're going to introduce this technology. And for this, I, I'll give a background of uh, artificial intelligence has been able to read mammograms better than radiologists for more than twenty years, and yet we still, of course, employ radiologists to read mammograms and. As far as I know, nobody has adopted AI as a primary uh, way of, of getting uh, medical data. So uh, I think what you've done just sounds fantastic. How will you get it into the hands of practitioners? 
how will you educate the next generation residents to use it? Absolutely. And just a fun bit of trivia, when we talk about innovative methods and diagnosis, it's not just AI and radiology, but pigeons have been trained to pick up breast cancer and pathology slides as good as, if not better than pathologists. So we don't see pigeons diagnosing. Um, I can put the link in the chat. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, we have that old age old adage that says the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. And I think this, the same holds true for XR. And so I want to um, throw back to some really important points brought back by Bill and Chris is a the importance of you know inclusion you know it's not just med ed isn't just about learners it's not just about um, residents and med students about this about including the patient perspective um, and even when we're talking about design it starts um, designing a new module as Christy said starts with the scoping process um, so for example we um, are some of our modules that are currently out there include airway management modules for regulatory bodies at the um, paramedic level it includes um, medical laboratory technology orientation to the laboratory modules for, um, again, the regulatory level. And so we can't create, you know, what we think is the best possible immersive experience um, without including the stakeholders. Don't do it for me without me. So when we're talking about building a new module, it starts with all of us at the table saying, what is our grand vision? Um, what is the nice to have? What is the need to have? And then what are the constraints? And, you know, um, I alluded to our work with space flight and, you know, we, it's the same thing there. We talk about, you know, the grand vision and then what uh, resources and reality allows us to do. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Now, uh, Bill, for you, uh, here you're creating a VR ability to, to basically uh, visualize the radiation therapy process in terms of dosimetry. Is that right? So you can see how much radiation is going to be absorbed by certain tissues. Is so that yeah, correct? That's one activity. That doesn't exist yet. The way the, it, it, That's exactly where we're headed with this. Right mm -hmm. now, Again, we're talking mostly the first, you know, the first step, the lower hanging fruit here is to be able to, to visualize the anatomy in an immersive, in a, in a high fidelity way. That's the first step to, to be able to import the DICOM images, which is the, the format of radiology uh, and, and radiation actually has a certain flavor of DICOM. So it really, and again, following up on whatever what everyone else said in terms of reality versus what you know what your 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 ultimate vision is, is to get the the coders and the IT people and all of those people in the back in the background um, to get on the same page so that I can even um, have them communicate to each other. Um, but ultimately, that's the goal because right now. Um, radiation dose is being visualized and um, modified and radiation is being planned in a 2d environment which certainly doesn't doesn't cut it like again we're we're, we're essentially um a surgical type procedure and and how could you possibly um totally comprehend and understand that radiation dose cloud unless you could look at it in three dimensions. There are groups that I'm talking to right now around the world. And um, the amazing thing is these aren't just virtual reality or XR developers, but these are medical physicists that actually work with the coders. So they truly understand the physics of the of the dose deposition, but 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 Ernie, you're 100 percent correct. That's where this is headed, um, is, is to be able to visualize that dose cloud in three dimensions to truly understand, uh, and to assure yourself that you're administering the dose in an efficacious way, but also in a safe way. Yes, wonderful. It'll be just magnificent for trainees and for patients. I, I think, uh, without a doubt. Now, I want to uh, go back, actually, to Christy, if I may. Christy, uh, I'm aware of 360-degree cameras to uh, take the images for uh, constructing VR uh, programs. But if I want to actually take you to the operating room and, and we want to say, look, we want this operation in VR so we can actually show it to our trainees and 
perhaps with with the ability to strip away layers as we're operating and show, oh, here's the lip, but here's the bony palate. Here's the cleft in the bony palate. Here's the the roof of the mouth, etc. Uh, can we do that today, uh, or, or is this a space shot? Um, actually, yes. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing three doing that in three hundred and sixty. I would do that in three D, um, which uh, I also really love creating three D environments. Um, and I think both have their use cases. And, and you know, three hundred and sixty is often really useful when you're wanting to connect with the people who are in the scene or it's, um, you know, if it's a 360 video, but um, 3D meta, meta humans are actually getting pretty impressive. So actually yeah. connecting with those characters um, could be a reality yeah. soon. Um, yeah. But yeah, definitely you can have uh, layers that, you know, you, you just interact in it and it removes a layer. I, I think there are actually simulations out there already that are doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, Shauna, tell us more about uh, your imaging and, and how you're working with radiologists. Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about um, creating the, a virtual reality radio, radiology reading room, um, you know, it's essentially creating a digital twin of the radiology workflow, which um, any radiologists who might be tuning in know is extremely cumbersome to have that um, 3D setup with high resolution monitors can cost at minimum $30,000 US. And so now imagine areas without that space, without that infrastructure. What if you could skip a step? What if you could provide that level of infrastructure? structure without needing that those three-dimensional physical structures. So what if you could, um, you know, import your DICOM images? What if you could scroll through a CT and adjust the um, contrast, the exposure in the same way you would in your traditional PACS system? Uh, what if you, what if I am as a rural physician, so by way of background, I 95% of, of my practice is rural ER. What if I'm not quite sure about the dorsal angulation on a distal radius fracture? Um, that's where I can maybe pop on my headset, phone a friend in RADS and say, what do you think of this angulation? Does this need to be um, reset? So we, that's the power of VR that we haven't talked about yet, that collaborative um, aspect of, you know, bringing in multiple minds for problem solving. Um, and so really, I think we're just at the beginning of unlocking the potential for all of these modalities. I'm really glad to see that 360 video is um, represented here today. We're big believers in that as well. Um, and so when we talk about specifically to radiology, coming back to what we're doing with our Sievert product. It's um, bringing radiology reading room infrastructure to remote rural communities in Canada that may not have that infrastructure. We're partnering with um, overseas uh, communities that are similarly resource um, limited in Ecuador, for example. Um, so this really is the beginning of uh, overcoming a major hurdle in diagnostic accessibility. So Shauna, let me just ask you another question. Then Bill, I have a question for you too. But uh, so back to this communicating with people in, you know, far out uh, places, Coos Bay is sort of, as we say, you can't, it's not the edge of the earth, but you can see it from there. And, and in fact, the Pacific Ocean is right there. So uh, I wonder, tell me, can you contrast for us augmented reality with virtual reality in the setting of trying to help somebody in remote locations? That's the perfect question ask and i'm really glad that you went there ernie because i'm going to take it a step further and say let's take an even more remote place let's take um long duration space flight missions so my other passion and background is space and extreme environment medicine and where vr comes into play is we've built those same um modules for the canadian space agency so again we that journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step we've started in vr so imagine you're the crew medical officer with only 40 to 60 hours of background training and that's the case for the National Space Station, the first time you learn to put an IV in on Earth is on Earth. And then nine months later, um, that's how long it takes to get to Mars. So that's when you finally get called to play, put that skill into play. If you haven't practiced that skill, your patient is going to be a pincushion. What if you could practice that skill in VR? Okay, so now let's come back to the next use case scenario that you specifically talked about, which is augmented reality. The communication delay from Earth to Mars, it can be 46 minutes round trip. Now imagine you have a cardiac arrest and it's the doctor who's down. How do you get through that scenario? This is the power of augmented reality. What if you could bring up your ACLS protocols in augmented reality to help guide you and your team through a successful cardiac arrest? 
let's come back a little bit closer to earth. Look at 90, so a, a significant percentage of our populations um, across the globe, 45% as per the 2019 uh, world census are rural. They do not have the bells and whistles of a traditional tertiary care hospital. So now imagine um, maintain your training, whether it's for ACLS, whether it's for ATLS and trauma protocols. Well, imagine you could bring up those augmented reality guidelines in real time just to say, okay, well, I don't remember the dose of um, the next dose of amiodarone for ACLS. CLS. You'll have it right in front of you. That's the power of augmented reality for equalizing the standard of healthcare on Earth yeah. and in space. Yeah, many people not, may not know, but in augmented reality, the dose of amiodarone can be right on the screen. Uh, so you can have protocols literally in front of your eyes at the same time you're looking down at the patient. Uh, so, Bill, I want to ask you a question, uh, a hypothetical question. Do you think that visualizing treatment plans in 3D could potentially increase the accuracy of the planning mathematics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you, you know, just like if you look at a digital camera, the way the, the, the algorithms are made, the, the algorithm, algorithms are made to write to not make a, a, a big mistake, you know, in the camera, not to completely overexpose or underexpose the imaging and it's and and what we're doing is what we're we're doing simulations we're playing chess matches with the computer uh, about dose de deposition of we can't see these molecules right we're but we're doing statistical averages that but the truth is what what's really important to remember and especially in my business um of of treating lung cancer that is um I'll contrast it this way. When you're treating tumors in the brain, you know, there are companies now that are focusing their augmented reality overlays for surgery on things like the brain. And the reason, one of the great uh, use case, why that's a great use case is because of the calvarium, because of the skull, right? You don't have excursions, you don't have respiration and movement. Whereas in my world, you're breathing and you're twisting and you're contorting, right? So you can imagine that, you know, we're basing our decisions on on pass or or fail a plan before it goes to the treatment machine on 2D, 2D static images. Now we do use what's called 4D CT to to get a bit, you know, about 800 images of CAT scan as the respiration goes up and down. But then I'm still required to make my decision based on based on some numbers, right? Based on uh, on a lot of numbers. But 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 in terms of the visual, we're really handicapped to look at a 2D image, static image, and say, oh, that looks good. Whereas I'm telling you, when you for the lung, it's moving, it's twisting, it's it, there's an excursion. And if I can look at that 4D movie instead of 2D on my computer, but really see it and allow myself my point of view where I can actually move around in the body, I could say, boy, when, they, when you get to this level of inspiration or expiration, I'm really not happy for how that dose falls off. Because remember, tumors aren't perfectly spherical tennis balls, right? They all are oblong and they have tails and they're tethered to chest walls. So it, it's just so intuitive that to look in, in, in an immersive environment would make, should make this a, a, a safer proposition. Right, exactly. Well, uh, we have to wrap up. So if I may, I think we have about two minutes, which gives us maybe 30 seconds apiece. Uh, Christy, let's start with you. What Oh, I think we lost your audio again. Oh, sorry. Uh, Christy, uh, in 30 seconds, what fundamental prediction or fact would you like to leave with your audience? Hmm. I would say fundamental prediction or fact. I mean, immersive learning isn't just coming. It's already here. It's it's being used um, in institutions across the world already. So it's not a question of like, when it will come, you know, if it'll come, getting ready. It's a question of actually coming together and deciding what what are the um, standards that we need for creating these learning simulations. Um, because we, we are we're already there. It's not a question of mm -hmm. whether it's coming. Um, so yeah, come coming together and setting these standards for how 
we can best help learners engage with these immer immersive experiences, how we can measure the success of, of these experiences for that learner, um, you know, engaging their, you know, using eye, eye tracking in the future and um, which it's being done in, in some cases now, but it could be more regular to actually see whether a student is um, actually engaged in the content they're learning and perhaps alter that that content based on you know their engagement and um, their biofeedback during the simulations. Thank you, K Karen. I guess our time is up. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. I'm sorry to um, I'm I'm sorry to uh, sort of cut things short. This was an amazing discussion, and uh, thank you uh, so much, Christy and Shauna and Bill and Ernie. Thank you very much for uh, taking the helm and moderating this. Um, really glad to have you all here. Valuable contributions. Um, we're grateful to you. <laughs>